Hello, thank you for watching Acute Care Surgery Nerds. Methamphetamine use is common and it's becoming more and more prevalent. We see a lot in trauma and in emergency general surgery. Today I'm going to review methantrauma. Methamphetamine is synthesized from phenylalanine to amphetamine, and the difference between amphetamine and methamphetamine is a meth part. The methyl portion makes it more lipid soluble and able to cross the blood brain barrier easier, therefore giving it a more intense effect. There are two isomers. The dextro isomer is what is abused and the levo isomer is a nasal decongestant. It is mostly excreted in the urine and the effects last 9 to 12 hours. Meth works by increasing the release of catecholamines and preventing the reuptake of them, so meth in and of itself does not have a direct sympathomimetic effect. Its major effect appears to be on dopamine. Meth is better than cocaine because cocaine only prevents the reuptake of catecholamines and cocaine is more expensive. I tried to look through. The estimated cost of making meth is about $100 an ounce, uh, with meth street value of $800 an ounce. Meth street value is approximately $3,000 a pound, so an ounce is about the weight of a pencil, a CD, a AA battery, or five quarters. Nagai Nagayoshi was a Japanese chemist and pharmacologist who isolated ephedra from the Chinese shrub in 1885. Then he created methamphetamine from the ephedrine in 1893. Meth was used in previous wars and kamikaze missions. The FDA approved methamphetamine for the treatment of narcolepsy, hay fever, and depression in 1944. And it was approved for obesity in 1947. The first death from amphetamine use that I could backsite and find was in 1939 in JAMA. So it wasn't actually approved for anything until 1944. This article talks about a 25 year old male who was at Purdue. He was athletic and a good student. He was taking an essay exam. And after about one hour, the patient had snoring respirations that caught the attention of students and the teacher. They laid the patient down. Another teacher gave him caffeine and began, quote, artificial respirations for about one hour. Sounds like there was vomitus. The patient died. About four hours afterwards, there was an autopsy. They do mention dilated atria, but no other major findings. They did examine the stomach and found some material. They developed a test for amphetamine and found that the patient did have amphetamines in his stomach. They knew this was a sudden collapse because they read through the patient's essay and it was, quote, good until the moment he collapsed. They spoke with the roommate and he reported that the patient would take a half tablet of amphetamine, 5 milligrams prior to each test. It just so happens that the patient had six tests within a four-day period. Uh, they deemed that the patient died from a complete vasometer collapse. In 1945, another death from amphetamine ingestion was reported. It talks about a 36-year-old male that had, quote, the blues and had a history of alcohol abuse. He was prescribed amphetamine to help him uh, for his loss of appetite and his blues, um, but this did not improve. He eventually was taken to the hospital by a co-worker, it seems. They found a note on him. It, it's kind of like a suicide note where he talks about taking more of the pills till he feels good again. Uh, there are notes after he arrived to the hospital, discusses how his arm and leg was paralyzed, then eventually he died. The, op the autopsy revealed a subarachnoid hemorrhage and subdural. So legal availability of methamphetamine ended in 1970s, and it was a designated Schedule II drug. It faded out of popularity until the late eight, uh, 1980s, when it reappeared in the western United States and Hawaii. Now methamphetamine is made across the country and abused by millions. The use classically began on the West, but has spread across the U.S. Uh, this is a map of 1994, 1995, 99, 2000, 2002, 2003, and 2004. The most recent data from National Survey on Drug that's about 300,000 more than the year prior. The There's a documentary by Paola Ramos and Weiss on methamphetamine epidemic in Fresno that came out in February 2019. 
you find on YouTube, I'll try to leave the link here so you can watch it. So I want to know how are trauma patients who use meth different? How are their outcomes different? There's really not a lot on meth and trauma, but there is enough to make a discussion out of it. This is a 2007 study from LA in the Journal of Trauma. Due to the increasing use of meth, they want to look at meth use and trauma outcomes. To do this, they looked at the trauma registry from 2002 to 2005. They excluded patients that were positive on the UDS for any other drug than meth. They compared patients who were meth positive against patients that were negative for all drugs. Uh, there were 5,372 patients in the study. 9.8% were meth positive. 90.1% were toxicurine negative. In the methamphetamine group, they were younger, had a higher percentage of males. They're more likely to have penetrating trauma and a lower GCS than a non-intoxication group. But just a little bit on the GCS and meth withdrawal. Um, when using meth, people often feel hyperactive and like they don't need to sleep. During meth withdrawal, they often feel the exact opposite, especially during the first week of withdrawal. People are likely to feel inactive, tired, sleepy. Symptoms of fatigue usually peak around the fifth day of withdrawal, during which people will sleep on average 11 hours a day. It's not uncommon to experience vivid dreams, but these usually subside uh, during the first week. So back to the paper. When they adjusted for age, gender, ethnicity, ISS, GCS, and mode of injury, they found no difference in mortality or ICU or hospital length of stay, but people with meth were more likely to go to the ICU. For this study, they were able to match 431 of the 526 uh, meth patients to non-intoxicated patients. Though there were more laparotomies in the meth group, there were no differences among the complications that were studied. Also note that we frequently worry about cardiac status in this group, but there is no difference. Finally, in the match groups, there were were no difference among outcomes, including no difference in mortality, 11.1% versus 10.9%. So what does it mean? The typical meth user is a white, unemployed, uninsured male, but more Hispanics tested positive for meth than the non-intoxicated. Not in the tables, but reported in the paper is that meth users were more likely to have humerus fractures. They think this, is, uh, this may be linked to being more likely to be hit by a car. But the bottom line is, patients exposed to methamphetamines do not have an increased mortality or complications or length of ICU and hospital stay. However, they are more likely to require laparotomy and admission to the ICU. They believe that the increased laparotomy and ICU admissions are due to the difficult assessment of these patients due to the meth. This is the February 2018 study in Addiction Science and Clinical Practice. Evaluation of the Effect of Methamphetamine on Traumatic Injury Complications and Outcomes is from an emergency medicine group in Colton, California at the Arrowhead Medical Center, a level 2 trauma facility in San Bernardino. They looked at patients aged 18 to 55 years old from 2005 to 2015. They created two groups, one with methamphetamine only, the other group that was negative for meth, cocaine, THC, and alcohol. This is a figure of how they got their study group. Over half of the patients were excluded because they were positive for cocaine, cannabis, or alcohol. After matching for age, gender, ISS, and mechanism, they had a total of 898 patients with 449 patients in each group. When the two groups were compared, there was a difference in pulse on scene, 103 versus 94, pulse in the trauma bay, 99 versus 94, systolic blood pressure on scene, 126 versus 131, and hospital length of stay, 4 days versus 3. There's no difference in hospital mortality, 3.3 versus 2.7%, and there was no difference in blood product usage. So the overall result is that yes, they found differences in pulse and systolic blood pressure among the meth patients, but these differences were relatively small and not really clinically significant. A pulse difference of 5 to 9 beats and a systolic blood pressure difference of 5 millimeters of mercury. Also, the hospital length of stay difference of one 
they may be multifactorial as mentioned by the authors. One example that may have an effect on this is that they say in their institution of a patient is meth positive and requires a non-emergent procedure, then they will repeat the TOS screen till it is negative, then they will proceed with the surgery. They say this is because meth use can have an effect on the anesthetic needed and it has been implicated in intracranial hypertension, reflex hypertension, and sudden cardiac death during anesthesia. They also believe that the difficulty in examining patients with meth use may lead to longer length of stay, as it may necessitate an extra diagnostic study, an extra day of observation, or require more placement issues. So long story short, outcomes among meth patients aren't really different among tox-negative patients, except they may be in the hospital longer. This is a study from March 2018 in the American Surgeon Journal from a group in Kansas titled The Impact of Methamphetamine Use on Trauma Patients at a Level 1 Trauma Center, a 10-year retrospective review. In the intro of this paper, it states that since meth use and trauma has mostly been studied in the West, being mostly from California, they should look at and validate previous findings in a different area of the U.S. Uh, they retrospectively looked at trauma patients from 2004 to 2013. They included patients with a positive UDS but excluded all patients that had an alcohol on board. They grouped patients as negative, drug without meth, drugs with meth, and meth only. The study found 2,321 patients. 75% were male, 89% were blunt trauma, 67% had a positive UDS excluding alcohol and meth, 22.5% had a negative urine tox screen, 8.1% had meth with another drug, and 1.6% of patients had meth only. So about 9.7% were using meth. Patients who tested positive for meth had the longest ICU length of stay, 3.3 days versus 2 in the negative group, and vent days, 2.8 days versus 1.2 days in the negative group. They found that patients with a positive UDS were more likely to acquire a surgical procedure, with 32.7% requiring surgery that included general anesthesia, and this was significantly different than in negative UDS patients. There was no differences in the group regarding head CTs, head injuries, uh, TBI concussions, or skull fractures, but there were differences in frequency of intracranial hemorrhage with meth-only patients having the highest percentage of 29%, and meth, was, uh, meth with other drugs having the lowest percentage of 10.1%. And they found that if a patient had a head bleed or skull fracture, this significantly impacted mortality, which makes sense. But the UDS result did not, ex uh, did not significantly alter the risk of mortality beyond the risk conferred by the skull fracture and cranial hemorrhage. And in comparing mortality, they found that there is a survival benefit if a patient is on drugs, but not when you include meth. Yet, despite having a mortality benefit, Patients who screened positive had a longer hospital and ICU length of stay and more vent days than negative patients, yet those were not significant. This paper supports prior studies that did not find an increased risk of mortality for trauma patients testing positive for methamphetamine. In addition, uh, this data provides support for prior studies that did not find a longer hospital or ICU length of stay associated with methamphetamines. Furthermore, UDS findings, including methamphetamine, did not affect the mortality risk of patients with traumatic intracranial hemorrhage or skull or facial fractures. There are a couple different ways to make methamphetamines. Um, there is the shake and bake method, which I'll try to add a link in right here. Um, but there is the risk of explosions, which I'll expand on. <laughs> I would tell you to go to hell. <laughs> okay, but but all these products combined are... So what about methane explosions? There's really not a lot on this. Why do meth labs explode? Most meth lab explosions are the result of different solvents evaporating in a poorly ventilated area and wafting to an ignition. This is particularly a problem if ether is used since it is heavier than air, highly explosive, and has a tendency to fill up several rooms and you can't smell it. Um, 
The other time this becomes an issue is with the extraction process where a large amount of alcohol and acetone are used to strip the pseudoephedrine ephedrine from the pills. Data from the National Inpatient Sample National Emergency Department uh, was examined. They wanted to know the national cost burden from people being burned from meth explosions or meth-related explosions. Basically, they looked at patients from 2003 to 2010 and tried to find first burn patients, then patients that use meth or have some drug dependence, then those patients who were injured by an explosion. So it's rather extrapolated. But they were looking for patients that exploded by making meth. They found that the incidence in 2003 was about 3,000 and increased uh, to 5,600 in 2010. So it increased by about 2,000 patients in the span of seven years. The national burden was about $81 billion in 2010. They stated that the greatest increase in meth burn explosions was after the 2007 recession in December. So one of the concerns regarding methamphetamine is its effect on the heart. I'll discuss this. The pathophysiology is very basic science, uh, but it's multifactorial having to do with catecholamine, catecholamine excess, direct cardiotoxic effects, coronary arterial vasoconstriction and ischemia. The histopathologic process includes contraction band necrosis and fibrosis from oxidative stress and free radicals. This is a 2018 study from UC Davis, uh, methamphetamine use and heart failure, prevalence, risk factors, and predictors. They looked at patients from 2014 to 2016 in the ED who had a positive UDS TOS screen and a BNP lab. They excluded cocaine and alcohol patients and those with previous history of coronary artery disease or heart failure. They used BNP as an indicator of heart failure. They had a total of 113,000 patients in the ED. 4,400 were meth positive and 714 of them received a BNP lab. Elevated BNP was found in 10.2% of meth patients versus 6.7% the combined meth negative and non-screened group. Among the meth positive patients, an elevated BNP was seen more with higher age, males, white race, former smokers, elevated heart rate, and lower temperature and creatinine. A total of 575 meth positive patients had an echo. There was a significant difference between BNP groups in normal and severe EF dysfunction, that being an EF less than 30%. Also, there was worsened LV diastolic function, increased LV in right ventricular dimensions, and elevated pulmonary arterial pressures in the abnormal BNP subgroup. I think the big part of this is that 60% of meth users who received an echo in this retrospective study had an abnormal echo. Further is that 40% of meth users had severe dysfunction on the echo. They then asked themselves, in a meth patient, what will predict either elevated BNP or severe uh, left ventricular EF dysfunction, that being less than 30%. Former tobacco smokers were 1.96 times more likely to have an abnormal BNP. Each unit increase in respiratory rates increased the odds of having abnormal BNP by 1.37. Each unit rise in creatinine increased the odds of abnormal BNP by 1.86. The only variable found to be predictive of a left ventricular EF less than 30% was respiratory rate, with each unit increase in breaths per minute having increased odds of 2.8. So why do former smokers have worse BNP than current smokers? Because Current smokers comprise 75% of meth patients with elevated BNP. This phenomenon has been detailed in the past as the smoker's paradox in which there appears to be poten potential advantages to smoking on the cardiovascular system. The smoker's paradox has been demonstrated in several clinical and preclinical studies and theories include beneficial effects on smoking-induced cardiac, cardiac gap junction remodeling changes in vascular reactivity due to the global ischemic conditions. So what about meth and surgery? This is a May 2019 study in the journal Orthopedics from Stanford. 
They looked at patients from 2013 to 2018 whom had a positive methamphetamine screen. Here are the demographics of the patients. They had a total of three complications in their 94 patients, making a complication rate of 3.2%. As there was only three complications, they helped describe them. It appears that one, uh, that one they felt was really attributed to meth use. So based on the ACC and AHA perioperative cardiovascular evaluation and care and non-cardiac surgery, fewer than 5% of orthopedic patients develop postoperative cardiac complications, and 7% in orthopedic trauma patients develop perioperative complications. So their rate of 2.1% is within that margin. But it is higher than the ACS NISQIP database of 1.3%. So overall, they deemed that in this small retrospective study, there was not an increased risk of perioperative complications in meth users for orthopedic trauma operative cases. But as this was the only study I, I could find in the first study of its kind, as mentioned in the article, there's obviously a need for more research into this area. So this is a paper from St. Louis. Uh, it basically found that vasopressor use does not change in meth users. Uh, vasopressor use is more based on adequate resuscitation, base deficit, and low MAPS. But this was a cohort study. So what about meth abscesses? Uh, there are several ways meth is used. It's, Injection effects last only a few minutes. It causes an extreme high. Uh, one website called it a rush or a quote swap. Snorting or oral ingestion produces euphoria, a high but not as intense of a rush. Snorting produces effects within three to five minutes and oral ingestion produces effects within 15 to 20 minutes. It can only be used. It can also be used rectally. It's called meth plugging. Anecdotally, I had a patient called a butt bomb. This is a 2015 study from New York. It's very basic science. Uh, methamphetamine alters the antimicrobial effects of phagocytic cells during um, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus skin infections. MRSA is present in over 60% of abscesses seen in the ED visits. And in particular, the USA 300 strain is the most common MRSA strain seen in skin and soft tissue infection in meth users. Not only, are abs not only do abscesses occur from the injection of meth, but meth users are subject to skin picking caused by formication, which is the sensation of something crawling uh, on or underneath the skin. Previous studies have found that meth injection causes apoptosis of thymic and splenic lymphocytes. It affects T-cells and affects antibody and cytokine production. These researchers want to know how it affects the development of MRSA infections. First, they created wounds on mice and monitored the healing process. They had untreated mice, MRSA-only mice, meth-only, and then meth and MRSA. As you can obviously see, both meth and MRSA, which is at the bottom, appeared to have the slowest healing process. This can also be seen at the graph at the bottom. The wound was basically healed on day 13 in the untreated mice, but still persistent in the meth MRSA mice. Qualitative histologic examinations reveal that wounds of untreated, uninfected mice and of meth-treated, uninfected mice had less inflammation along with increased fibrin deposition than the MRSA-infected MRSA -infected tissues and no evidence of bacteria. MRSA-infected mice show localized epidermal inflammation. However, wounds with meth-treated MRSA-infected mice had intense inflammatory infiltrates in both the epidermal and dermal layers, along with extensive cell necrosis. This is seen in the bottom right photo. The blue dye is collagen deposition. They found that MRSA, and then even more so when MRSA is combined with meth, have more collagen degradation, which in turn affects wound healing. This graph shows that math not only alters the viability of staph, therefore the growth kinetics are not changed, but meth does support the formation of staph biofilms and colony forming units compared to untreated cultures. The graph in B and optical density pick in C suggests that there are metabolically active cells in the colony forming units when meth is present. 
So this paper has a lot more information and is very dense, but long story short is that meth does affect wound healing, most specifically in the presence of infection and in this paper MRSA. So the effect comes in a manner of poor immunity from meth use and the co combination of meth with MRSA amplifies the effects of MRSA. So how about the difference in spider bites and meth abscesses? Sometimes patients present and they say that this is a spider bite, but it may be a meth abscess. Uh, this is a tangent. Um, the brown recluse spider is probably, I feel anecdotally, the most common spider that patients mentioned that they were uh, bitten by. So this is a a way to depict if the bite was from a spider uh, called Notch Recluse in as numerous. Uh, there's typically only one lesion uh, if a spider bites, a brown recluse spider bites. Uh, sometimes there may be two, but they're very close together. Occurrence, oh, typically the spider is uh, disturbed. Occasionally they may be in clothes, um, and sometimes they do crawl into beds. T is timing. Typically bites occur from April to October in North America. R is the red center. There's usually central necrosis. It may be pale, blue, white, purple, but very rarely is the center red. E is elevated. Recluse spider bites are usually sunken or flat, not elevated. C is chronic. Most heal uh, within three months. L is large. Most will be smaller than 10 centimeters. Uh, U is ulcerates. Ulcerations usually occur from 7 to 14 days post vitimation. Uh, S is swelling. Bites below the neck typically will not cause significant swelling. And E is exudative. Uh, there may be a blister that develops, but in the case of a brown recluse bite, uh, there's not purulence. This is a depiction of how a brown recluse spider bite evolves over time. A is uh, day one, B is day nine, C is day 16, and D is day 25. So one of the more recent uh, papers regarding meth and trauma, uh, the rising tide of methamphetamine use in elderly trauma patients. Um, this is uh, from t uh, 2008 to 2018. There's been a 35% increase in persons over the age of 65. Uh, they looked at trauma patients from 2009 to 2018, including patients with drug screens and over the age of 55. Illicit uh, drug use, substance use increased over the past 10 years in the elderly trauma population. While alcohol use remained stable, the most common substances used during the study period were alcohol, THC, and meth. Of note, recreational marijuana use was legalized in California in 2018, and medical marijuana use has been legal since 1996. However, there was no significant difference in the rate of THC positivity the year before compared with the after legalization of recreational marijuana. Similar to studies of younger meth patients, meth elderly trauma patients had an increased rate of violent injury and penetrating injury mechanisms, including higher rates of assault and self-inflicted injury. Meth-only patients had longer ICU and hospital length of stay and more vent use and died or left AMA. They found that elderly meth patients were more severely injured and required a higher level of care than other elderly patients. Furthermore, uh, within their, the researchers' county, individuals 55 to 64 years of age had the highest rate of meth-related deaths of any age group. Uh, this is highlighting the importance of fo focusing on this population. Although mortality trended higher in the uh, elderly meth cohort, death is relatively rare occurrence in trauma care overall. After controlling for injury characteristics and age, uh, no substances independently increase the risk of death in elderly trauma patients. Compared to the widely published data in younger uh, cohorts, these findings enhance our understanding of meth use and trauma by showcasing characteristics of injuries and outcome trends in the older population. That's the conclusion of the presentation. Um, went over history. Meth patients' outcomes in the research don't really show that they are any different than the non-meth patients. 
There may be some small changes in their vitals. They may be more likely to be admitted to an ICU or in the hospital a little bit longer, but no real differences in mortality. One paper I reviewed says that the incidence of heart issues is high in meth users, maybe up to 60%, and as far as surgical outcomes, the only study we found showed no difference, but it is only one study. As far as other things, meth perpetuates poor healing and the development of abscesses, which I feel is the main thing that we treat that is directly related to meth. Uh, thank you for listening and watching Acute Care Surgery Nerds. Uh, please leave comments and let me know your thoughts. Thank you. Bye.